All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome here to another edition of Planetarium Online. Uh, my name is Andrew. I'm one of the planetarium educators at Liberty Science Center in the Jennifer Chalstey Planetarium, and I'm very excited to be here with you this afternoon, where we'll be talking all about my favorite topic in the universe, black holes. So we'll be answering some of your black holes questions during the program. Um, I'll do my best to answer as many of them as I can uh, as we go on throughout uh, the program today. Uh, I also have my colleague Krista who will be uh, answering in the comments through text uh, as Liberty Science Center, so she'll be answering some of your questions as well. We'll be talking though today about some of the questions that we get most often um, at the Science Center when we talk about black holes. We'll also be talking about some questions that even the scientists who know the most about black holes still have left unanswered. So we've got a lot to talk about today, um, but before we begin completely, a few very, very quick things. Um, if you'd like to support Planetarium Online and the Liberty Science Center, there is a donate button located somewhere around uh, somewhere around my head right now, somewhere around our video stream. Uh, that's the best way that you can support the Science Center uh, if you'd like to and if you are able to. Uh, I'm also very excited to today talk to you about a really exciting event we have going on uh, on Monday, September 21st at 8 o'clock in the evening. We are throwing uh, our annual celebration of science. Normally this takes place at the Science Center, but this year we're doing it virtually. It's called the I Stand for Science, and we're, we're going to be doing a lot of really, really great stuff. There's going to be a planetarium show where you'll be seeing me uh, talking all about the night sky. Um, we'll be celebrating uh, some of the scientists and the public health leaders who are leading the fight uh, uh, against COVID. Um, we'll be celebrating some other wonderful scientists. And, uh, and what I'm really excited for is this year we're going to be featuring um, some, some, uh, some high school students from New Jersey and some of the great great science and some of the great research that they've done over, over the past about year or two. So it's going to be uh, our I, I Stand for Science, our uh, virtual celebration of science happening here on our Facebook page, uh, September 21st. Um, that's, that's a Monday at 8 o'clock p.m. Uh, I'll be there, so I hope to see uh, many of you there as well. There is an event all about it on our Facebook page right now. You can go ahead and... and uh, find that once we're all wrapped up here today. Um, also, we are reopened. We just, uh, we're, we're just entering into our second week of the Science Center being reopened. So for now, we're going to be open Thursdays, Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. Um, so you can stop by the, the Science Center, uh, the planetarium is reopening, or it has reopened with a couple of really, really great planetarium shows. But you can find out all the details about our reopening and purchasing tickets on our website, uh, lsc.org. With all of those kind of housekeeping things, though, out of the way, um, let's go ahead and begin. We're talking today all about black holes, talking about questions that you have. I already saw one question in the chat, a couple of questions in the chat um, about why are black holes black? We're going to answer that question in just a little bit. Um, so let's begin by going over just some, some sort of basics about what exactly a black hole is, the sort of properties of black holes. So when I think of a black hole, I think of four main things, right? Black holes have lots and lots of mass. Even the smallest black holes have inside of them more mass than is in our entire sun. But we have all of that mass crammed into a very, very small volume in space. Black holes are really small um, uh, for how much mass they have, which gives them a ton of gravity, right? We're talking about cramming in the mass of multiple suns into a space that's like at the smallest, a mile across. Some of them get bigger. We'll talk about that as well. But the key to black holes is that there are a lot of mass crammed into a small volume, which gives them tons of gravity. They are the strongest sources of gravity once you get close to them. But what really truly makes a black hole a black hole is that nothing can escape from one. Not even light. 
So if we were to look at a black hole standing all on its own in space, it would look exactly like this. It would just look like nothing. No light can leave a black hole. Think about how you're seeing me right now and seeing the screen. Light is coming from your screen into your eyes. When you look out at the sky, you see the sun because light comes from the sun toward your eyes. Don't look right at the sun, though. It'd be kind of dangerous. We can't see black holes because no light leaves them. It means they look completely dark. So black holes are very strange objects, right? But the key to them is that nothing can escape a black hole, not even light itself. This happens because of an effect called escape velocity. So every object in the universe has an escape velocity. That is how fast you need to travel to leave an object, right? So we can leave the Earth as it is right now in a rocket ship. To do that, we need to make this rocket travel at 25,000 miles per hour, just about, straight away from the Earth. Traveling at that escape velocity, the rocket leaves the Earth and it doesn't come back, unless it turns around, then it would come back. If we made the Earth about one quarter, though, of its current size, this rocket would need to travel much faster to leave it. The escape velocity from an object or from the Earth at a quarter of its current size would be about to do, would be about 47,000 miles per hour. To turn the Earth into a black hole, that is to say an object with an escape velocity faster than the speed of light, we need to cram it down to being just a couple of inches across. Doing that, we create an object with an escape velocity of 670 million miles per hour. So dense, so small, that nothing can leave it. So the escape velocity for an object goes up when you either make it smaller or you make it more massive. And black holes are both of those things, right? Black holes are both incredibly massive and incredibly small. Now, another question I get very often is, are black holes dangerous? And no, they really aren't to us. Black holes only get dangerous if we get close to them, which we're never going to do, right? So black holes alone are not dangerous at all. Only if you get close to them can they possibly be dangerous. And when I say close, I mean within a few thousand miles, right? And we're not going to be doing that anytime soon. So, let's go through here a little bit. Let's see what questions we can answer so far. So Elizabeth asks, uh, so she says that her seven-year-old son loves black holes and is wondering how ultra-massive black holes form. That is a good question that we do not have an answer to. We'll be talking about that toward the end of the program today, but we don't know how the most massive black holes form. We do know, though, how smaller black holes form. Smaller black holes form from really big stars, stars that are maybe 15 or 20 times the mass of the sun can create black holes. During the course of this star's life, it's being powered by nuclear fusion. That is, it's combining elements together really, really hot, keeping the star going. Eventually, though, those elements run out. The star can't support itself. The force of gravity causes it to collapse, and that star will explode. The outer layers are sent flying away into space, while the center of the black, or the center of that star, collapses down to a single point in space, leaving behind a black hole. So, we don't know how the biggest black holes form, but we do know how these smaller black holes form. These black holes would be somewhere around 3 to maybe 5 or 10 times the mass of the sun. 
and that would make them just about several miles across. So pretty small for something so incredibly massive. So, um, so Kate also wants to, or so Kate wants to know where is the closest black hole to us? So Kate, that's a question that I have kind of a new answer to as of about five months ago. Um, so let's actually go ahead and take a look at that closest black hole to us. Great question, Kate. Really, really great question. So the closest black hole to us is named HR6819. It was discovered uh, this past April, I believe, either April or March. I don't remember which. This black hole is about 1,000 light years away from us or about this many miles, right? This is uh, really far away, really, really far away. It would take us thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years for us to travel there. What was really exciting about this black hole was how we found it and the kind of system that this black hole exists in. We found this black hole by studying very closely two stars. And when we watched these two stars very closely, we noticed that there was something over here. That by studying the orbits of these two stars, there was a missing object, a missing source of mass, a missing source of gravity. So it turns out that toward the center of this system of these two stars is a black hole right here, or, um, right here at the end of the little red line. So by studying those other two stars, learning that their orbits were kind of funky, right? They didn't quite match up to what we saw. We knew that there had to be another source of mass here and another source of gravity but we didn't see it with our eyes. No light came from this object. So we concluded that this had to be a black hole, which is pretty incredible. Remember, this black hole is still a thousand light years away. It is no danger to us at all. In fact, it's not even a danger to this star that it's a whole lot closer to than we are. So this black hole is, is no danger to the star. It's no danger to us. It's so far away, right? Thousand light years. We could never even dream of traveling here with our current technology. So nothing really for us to worry about. Nothing really for us to worry about. Let's... So uh, Anne wants to know how many black holes are there in the Milky Way? That is such a good question. Um, we, we suspect that in the whole Milky Way galaxy, that is what we're about to be seeing here in just a moment, we suspect there are somewhere around 10 million black holes. We've only found about 70 of them. So we've got a lot to find, but we, we suspect in our galaxy there's somewhere around 10 million black holes, 10 million of them. We've found about 70 um, in, in our galaxy, so there's more that we haven't quite found. Ah, so Mark wants to know, uh, what is a light year? That's a really, really great question. So a light year is the distance that light travels in one year. Let me see. Um, let's see, I thought I had a really cool thing to show the speed of light. Let me look and see if I could find it. But the speed of light is how fast light travels in one year. So when, so light travels in one year, about five or six trillion miles, right? About six trillion miles. 
So one light year is six trillion miles, which means a thousand light years is whatever six trillion times a thousand is. Six gazillion? I don't know how to say that number, unfortunately. Um, so it's really, 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 really big. It's a really, really big distance. But it's just a way that astronomers measure really big distances. Ooh, uh, Amutha wants to know how long has that black hole been there? We don't know. We don't actually know that. Um, likely for millions of years, or at least hundreds of thousands of years. Um, but we, we don't really know. We didn't watch it form. We just, we see it now. Um, so we don't know exactly how long it's been there for, but we know it's been there for at least probably millions of years, um, maybe even longer than that. Um, which brings me to another really great question. Do black holes have life cycles? Like stars do. So do black holes change over their lives? Um, kind of. Kind of. So black holes don't really, uh, their lives don't really end necessarily. Black holes will live for trillions of years. Um, black holes can, over time, get bigger as they eat gas. Um, which is a pretty cool thing. Um, make sure you see if I can find... Um, so, so yeah, black holes can get bigger as they eat gas, but for the most part, black holes don't really have defined life cycles like stars do. They kind of last almost forever. So another question that uh, I've seen at least once so far and that I get maybe more than any other question uh, in my career Kind of a two-part. Could the sun ever become a black hole? And what would happen if it would? So, to ease our minds a little bit, the sun can never turn into a black hole. Never, ever, 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 ever. It can never happen. The black hole, or to become a black hole, you need to be a star that's at least 15 to 20 times the mass of the sun. And the sun isn't quite that massive, so it would never, ever turn into a black hole. The sun will never turn into a black hole. But what if it did, right? It's an interesting thought experiment. Would the planets be sucked into the, to the black hole? Would, would the solar system cease to exist? Great question. So we're looking here at the solar system. We've got the sun at the center. We've got four planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars out here. If we replaced the sun with a black hole that's the same mass as the sun, this is what would happen. The planets would continue their orbits exactly as they were before. They would no longer be getting any sunlight, so they'd be cold, but the planets would keep going around in their orbits which might be kind of confusing, right? But black holes aren't these big cosmic vacuum cleaners that are actively trying to like suck in the whole universe. That's not how black holes work. Black holes are sources of gravity, just like the sun is a source of gravity. So if we took the sun and replaced it with the black hole of the same mass, well, the planets would keep on going around in their orbits, which is really interesting. We'd be very cold because there wouldn't be any more sunlight getting to us, um, but, the, but the Earth would continue to orbit. It would continue on its path around this new black hole sun pretty much forever. So when you're far enough away from a black hole, they're just like any other source of gravity. But what would happen if we got really close to a black hole? Say, what would happen if we got close to this black hole? What would happen if we got extremely close to a black hole? Well, let me clarify one quick thing. 
we're talking about now is going to be what would happen if we got to a black hole that was a smaller one that was around maybe five to ten times the mass of our sun what would happen if we got really close to a black hole like this one we actually have a word for it for what would happen if we got very close to a smaller black hole that word is spaghettification spaghettification probably my favorite word in the english language i think it's an official word in the dictionary now spaghettification you might get a hint of what spaghettification is based on the word right it means essentially to be turned into a piece of spaghetti so let's take let's take a mannequin of an astronaut not a real astronaut not a real person let's just take a mannequin in in a spacesuit and throw them toward this black hole we're going to put them in feet first okay we're going to see what's going to happen as this astronaut mannequin gets closer to the black hole the gravity from this black hole will pull more strongly on this astronaut's feet than it will on its head that means its feet are going to slowly get pulled closer and closer to the black hole while its head does not because the force of gravity is stronger on this astronaut mannequin's feet they're going to get stretched out really really thin so thin that they turn into a little piece of spaghetti as they're pulled into the black hole. So spaghettification means you're getting pulled very thinly by the gravitational force of a black hole. Remember, this only happens if you get really, really close to one. I mean within 10 or maybe 100 miles away. Really, really close. And we're never going to get that close to a black hole, right? That's never going to happen to one of us, right? But another interesting thing to note is we don't know what it's like once we are actually inside a black hole. We don't know what it's like in here, right? We don't know what it's like inside of a black hole. We've never been into one. We never can go into one. Are too far away a black hole inside of it we think would be incredibly bright all this light and heat would be trapped inside of it we don't know for sure we think it'd be really bright and really hot but we don't really know we could never send anything in to be able to send information back out or actually find out for certain either so there are a lot of unanswered questions about black holes like this. One of them is we don't know what it's like inside of one. I guarantee it would not be fun. I would not recommend going into one. It would be a very, very bad time. A very, very bad experience. Wouldn't recommend it. But thankfully, we're never going to fall into a black hole. Let me see, let me see. So let's answer a few questions here. Let's answer a few questions here. So Clark wants to know, why do black holes eat gas? A really, really good question. We can actually see this happening a little bit here. So we have a black hole, which is this thing directly at the center. And around it is this big disk of gas. Now this disk of gas is close enough to this black hole that a lot of this gas gets pulled into the black hole because of its gravity. So once something gets close enough to a black hole, it gets pulled into it. And this happens just because the black hole has gravity, right? The same thing happens to objects that would get too close to the Earth, right? The Earth is a source of gravity. If you get too close to the Earth, you get pulled into the Earth, right? That's why we're not leaving the Earth, and the Earth's gravity holds us here. So in that way, black holes are no different than any other object in space. So if gas gets too close to a black hole, it gets pulled in, right? Just like if anything else got too close to the sun, it gets pulled into the sun. Um, that's just one of those kind of intrinsic things about black holes and about gravity in general. So Sonia wants to know, will a black hole eat the Milky Way one day? And 
I'm sure you'll be happy to hear that no, a black hole will never eat the Milky Way. Because black holes can only pull things in that are really, really close by to them, right? So the Milky Way is so big, right, that there could never be a black hole big enough. It have to be, have to be bigger than the whole Milky Way. So black holes can only eat things, can only pull things into them that get really close. And there's no way a, a black hole would ever be big enough to be close to the whole Milky Way to be able to devour it. So that'll never happen. Thankfully for us, that's, I'm sure that's really, really great news to hear. But black holes don't actively sort of suck in objects from the whole universe, right? It's only when you get really close to one that that happens. So only this gas that's really close can fall into this black hole. Nothing far away will get sucked into it. Only, only things that are really, really close to it. That's one of those things that's kind of confusing about black holes. So Sandra wants to know, is it possible to travel through a black hole? And where would we end up if it was possible? So let's pretend for a moment that we could survive a trip into a black hole. Let's pretend for just a moment that we could survive our trip into the black hole, which we couldn't, unfortunately. Let's pretend that we could. We don't know what would happen. What's likely is that once you travel into a black hole, you're just in the black hole. You're just a part of it. Um, it's not likely that a black hole would ever lead to anywhere else. We don't think black holes are portals to other dimensions. We don't think that they're wormholes. But we don't know that for sure. We don't know with 100% certainty that a black hole couldn't be a wormhole. We don't know, but we're pretty confident that black holes aren't wormholes, that black holes couldn't take us to another part of space or take us um, to another dimension. We don't think that would happen. But we don't know what it's like inside of one, right? That's still a mystery for us. We don't really know, right? It's, it's pretty cool. And we may never know what the inside of a black hole is like which is a very strange thought, a very, very strange thought. Let's see, so uh, Amutha wants to know how do black holes form and how long do they take to form? And that is such a good question. So let's talk about different types of black holes. There are three main kinds of black holes. They are stellar mass black holes. These are around 3 to 30 times the mass of the sun. So those contain inside of them 3 to about 30 solar masses. That means 3 to 30 times the mass of the sun. Another kind of black hole it's what we call a supermassive black hole. These are black holes that have more than one million solar masses in them. So this is anywhere from a million to a billion to a trillion solar masses. And what we're not sure about is whether there's any kind of black hole in the middle, right? Are there black holes that exist between the stellar mass black holes, 30 solar masses, and the supermassive ones that are a million solar masses. We don't know for sure if there's anything in here. Let's talk about how these two kinds of black holes form, right? So stellar mass black holes form from the collapse of really big stars. So stars that are maybe 20 times the mass of the sun, those can collapse and those can form these stellar mass black holes, right? So how do supermassive black holes? Well, we have one of those black holes at the center of the Milky Way galaxy, right? 
exactly at the center of our galaxy, right about here, there is a supermassive black hole. This supermassive black hole contains inside of it about four and a half million times the mass of the sun. It's orbited by all of this, all these about two or three dozen stars close to it. Um, and that's how we know it's there. So there is a supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way. It is not eating these stars because they're far enough away. It's not eating the Milky Way. In fact, this black hole at the center is important. The whole galaxy kind of formed around this black hole, right? And so we think that every big galaxy in the universe, every bright galaxy in the universe, including the Milky Way, including all of these other 20,000 galaxies we're going to hopefully see here in just a moment, all of these bright big galaxies have supermassive black holes at their centers. But we don't know how those black holes got there. We don't know where these supermassive black holes came from. We just don't know. One idea we have is that maybe these black holes formed when lots of smaller black holes combined together, right? Maybe we take a bunch of stellar mass black holes, smash them together, and you get black holes millions or billions of times the mass of the sun. But the universe isn't old enough for that to have happened yet. The universe isn't old enough for supermassive black holes to have formed from the combination of smaller black holes, at least really small black holes. So maybe the supermassive black holes at the centers of these galaxies, maybe they formed with the universe. Maybe they were born with the rest of the universe. That's a pretty interesting thought. Or another thought that we have about how these sort of black holes formed is that maybe they formed from this third kind of black hole. Maybe there were a bunch of these intermediate mass black holes, black holes in between these stellar mass and these supermassive black holes. Maybe there were a bunch of black holes that were thousands or hundreds of thousands of times the mass of the sun. Maybe these formed from these initial just absolutely gigantic star, bigger than any star we know today. Maybe these black holes, these intermediate mass black holes formed in the early universe. Maybe then those intermediate mass black holes formed together and combined to supermassive black holes. But we don't know, right? In fact, we don't even know if intermediate black holes exist. We don't know for sure if they do exist. The best evidence we have for intermediate mass black holes comes from small galaxies. The Milky Way is a big galaxy, right? Home to billions of stars, billions of planets. But there are smaller galaxies out there. We call them dwarf galaxies. These two galaxies here are called the Large Magellanic Cloud and the Small Magellanic Cloud. They kind of orbit around the Milky Way. And we think that at the centers of dwarf galaxies, maybe not these two in particular, there could be intermediate mass black holes. There's a thought that maybe the more massive a black hole is, the bigger its galaxy is. We don't really find that, though, quite yet. We don't know. So to answer the original question, which was how do ultramassive or supermassive black holes form, we don't quite know. We have a lot of ideas, but um, it's one of those things that has more questions than answers, right? We just don't know. 
We just don't, right? Which can be a really frustrating answer, but that's what makes science so cool. We're still learning about these kinds of things. Let's see. So Christopher, to answer your question, so on the small end of the black hole spectrum, if the black hole is only three solar masses, it must occupy a volume smaller than the Earth or smaller. And yes, that is exactly correct. So for, um, for small black holes that are around three to 30 times uh, the mass of the sun, um, they, they, they would be smaller than the Earth. So for example, black hole that is 30 or that is three times the mass of the sun is only about 10 miles across right it would fit inside of manhattan right only about 10 miles across a black hole that's 30 times the mass of the sun would only be about 55 or about 100 miles across so that's still smaller than the earth right so to get a black hole that is uh, that is about the size of the Earth, let me let me do some math here real quick. Um, everyone loves watching me do math. I hope to get a black hole that is the that is about the size of the Earth, it would need to be uh, about two thousand times the mass of the Sun. So you need to get a pretty massive black hole to make it. Um, uh, to make it comparable in size to the Earth. Pretty cool. So, no. would a black hole disintegrate because of virtual particles if it were not fed? Margie, that is such a great question. Um, and, the, and the answer to that question is we think so. So there's this idea of something called Hawking radiation. Let me bring up our little test kind of sample black hole one more time here. So I said earlier that nothing could escape a black hole. That wasn't strictly true. There is a way for things to leave a black hole, something called Hawking radiation. Toward the edge of a black hole, um, particles can, can, through weird effects of quantum mechanics, leave a black hole. But it's a very small amount of mass relative to how big a black hole is. So if a black hole were left alone with nothing to kind of feed on for a really long time, eventually that black hole would kind of disintegrate. But it would take literally trillions of years based on our understanding. And we're still figuring out how Hawking radiation works, how these sort of virtual particles work. We don't know. We don't know for sure. But our best idea is that if a black hole, a stellar mass black hole, was left unfed for trillions of years, eventually it would disintegrate. Eventually. But again, we're talking trillions of years. That's older than the universe. Right, so it takes a really, really long time for something like that to happen. But that is such a good question. Thank you for asking it. Crystal wants to know what is, what is the Ton six eighteen black hole. So the Ton six eighteen black hole is the most massive black hole we ever discovered. So, so the Ton six eighteen black hole is the most massive black hole that we have ever found in the universe to date. Um, that black hole contains inside of it, I'm, I'm trying to remember, it's about 60 or 65 billion times the mass of the sun. 60 to 65 billion times the mass of the sun. So that would fall on the extreme end of our supermassive black hole here. That This would fall away in the extreme end of what we call a supermassive black hole. Let's see. So, uh, Golden wants to know what is the, what is uh, what is the color that we're seeing with the black hole. Good question. Something that I should have mentioned earlier. So, what we're seeing around this black hole right here is gas. 
right? All this white, all this yellow and orange and gold. This is all color from gas around the black hole. The black hole is just the spot at the center. And all this gas is what's left around it. This is, this is just gas around the black hole. Remember, we can never see the black hole itself, but we tell it's here because of all this gas around it, right? We can tell it's here because of all this white and yellow and gold gas around it lets us know that it's there. Ooh, okay, so Crystal wants to know how many black holes are there in the entire universe? That is a question we don't know the answer to, at least not an exact number. Let's do some math, though, real quick. Again, we're, we're doing math today, lots of math when it comes to black holes. So let's assume that every galaxy in the universe, all of them, have around 10 million black holes, like our Milky Way does, right? The Milky Way has about 10 million black holes. And every galaxy, so in the universe, there's about 2 trillion black holes. So if, if every galaxy, 2 trillion galaxies, has about 10 million black holes, then there would be about 2 trillion times 10 million black holes. Whatever that number is, I don't know. That's about 20 million trillion, I guess, is the best number that I can give you right now. Somewhere around there. An unfathomable number of black holes. So many black holes that we can't even begin to think about that many of them. There's a lot of black holes. Almost too many black holes, if you ask me. It's too many black holes to think about. So there are trillions and trillions of black holes out there. I wish I'd give you an exact number, but but uh, well, we don't we don't know an exact number, unfortunately. So Katal wants to know: Can a black hole move, or is it stationary? And that's a really good question. Um, so black holes do move. Black holes do move. So. Sun, let me actually pull up where our sun is real quick, our Milky Way. So our sun, which is right here at the center of this little white circle, our sun travels around the Milky Way, right? It makes these orbits. As uh, time goes by, it sort of makes a big orbit around the galaxy like this. So black holes do the same thing. If a black hole was out here somewhere, it would make an orbit around the center of the Milky Way, just like, just like the sun does. So black holes do move, but they move the same way that stars do, very slowly, taking them millions of years to make one orbit around the Milky Way. So they do move, but not in any dangerous way. There's no black hole that's on a collision course with the Earth or anything wild like that, thankfully. More good black hole news. More black, uh, more good black hole news. Let's see. So Crystal wants to know what is a white hole? So a white hole is a theoretical object. We don't know if they exist. That's like the opposite of a black hole. So where a black hole is an object that nothing can escape from, a white hole would be an object that nothing can stay in, right? It's pushing stuff out of it. We don't know if they exist. There are some ideas out there that a white hole could be kind of, if you go through a black hole, you come out the other end in a white hole, but we don't know if they exist, right? There's no evidence of them like there is evidence of black holes. Ah, okay. So Jorge wants to know, 
do black holes affect time around it? And that, my friend, is a really, really good question. Let me do a little bit of setup here to give us some visuals. Um, because time around a black hole is really, really strange. Time around black holes is really, really strange. So black holes have this very weird effect where space and time itself is actually warped around a black hole. So I've, I've just spontaneously created a black hole for us here to kind of demonstrate that effect a little. Let me bring down this accretion disk of gas for us here to kind of see what's, what's going on. So space and time around black holes are warped. We can see that happening here. Light that travels near this black hole is bent by the black hole's gravity. But space and time are intertwined. So when space is bent by this black hole's gravity, time is also bent by a black hole's gravity as well. That means if you traveled close to a black hole, Time would move more slowly for you. So, for example, if this close to a black hole, if you waited a year, slowly orbiting this black hole safely, something like maybe a hundred or a thousand years would pass for people on the Earth. So, time moves more slowly close to black holes. Time moves more slowly when you're close to any massive object, but especially black holes, right? Because black holes are really dense, so the effect is kind of exaggerated there. If you've ever seen the movie Interstellar, there's uh, there's some uh, talk about that in that in that movie as well, about time moving more slowly close to a black hole. So. If you orbited this black hole for 100 years, you would, you would age by 100 years, and maybe 10,000 years would go by for the rest of the Earth, which is wild to think about. But black holes are wild, right? They are, they are very, very, very interesting, very strange objects. So uh, this looks pretty cool, so I'm just going to kind of leave this going for a little bit here. Kate asks, can black holes break space-time? They can't really break space-time necessarily, but they do warp it very, very strongly. I guess you would call that breaking space-time. Um, but I would say they break it necessarily. They just warp it significantly. Just like uh, you putting like a, like a really massive like bowling ball at the center of a trampoline, you're going to warp that trampoline, but not necessarily break it. Right. Maybe a bad analogy because you could break a trampoline with a big enough bowling ball, but you know it's close enough as an analogy, I think. So Elizabeth wants to know, what if a black hole, a neutron star, a wormhole, and a white hole entered the solar system? So let me begin answering that question by saying this is never going to happen, right? We're never going to have a black hole, a neutron star, a white hole enter the solar system. But what if it happened? What if it happened? Well, I would say most likely nothing, which may be a confusing answer. But the solar system is huge, right? The solar system is like even if we're just looking at this inner part here with all the planets this is still tens of millions of miles in every direction right so if a black hole just wandered into this part of the solar system not necessarily a whole lot would happen it would have a gravitational pull don't get me wrong it would probably pull planets out of their orbits a little bit um but it wouldn't necessarily destroy the solar system um necessarily it would definitely pull the planets out of alignment but it wouldn't necessarily rip the solar system apart. 
At least not at first. Over time, it probably would. Um, but it, it wouldn't be necessarily the sun explodes or is eaten instantly. If the star got really, really close to the sun, or the black hole got really close to the sun, or the neutron star got really close to the sun, then really, really bad stuff would happen to it. But the planets would survive a black hole entering the solar system. They would just be thrown out of their orbits. It still survive, just be in a in a different kind of different kind of state. They'd, they'd be in a different place. Let's see. So Crystal wants to know what is an ultra massive black hole. So an ultra massive black hole is kind of a black hole on the extreme end of our black hole classification. So I, I could have also wrote an ultra massive. That would be something that's like more than a billion times the mass of the sun. Um, so ultra massive black holes are more massive than supermassive black holes. And down here on the spectrum, they're like billions of times the mass of the sun. All right. I'm looking down at my clock right now, and I'm looking over at our chat, and we are almost out of time here. So I'm going to answer one, maybe two more questions before we do need to wrap up our program today. So I do, before we wrap up, want to thank you all for your questions. You, you guys have asked so many cool questions. This has been a lot of fun for me. I hope it's been uh, really entertaining and engaging for you all as well. Um, if we didn't answer your questions, we're sorry. As you can see, there's so many questions. Um, but before we finish uh, wrapping up um, with our last couple of questions, uh, as a reminder, if you want to donate to support the Science Center and Planetarium online and you're able to, um, there's a donate button uh, on your screen somewhere. Could be, uh, could be over by my head over here, over here, up here, down here. I don't know where it's at on your screen, um, but that's a great way to support us if you are able to. Um, we also hope to see you tuning in for our virtual celebration of science, which will be taking place on September 1st, or September 21st, September 21st at 8 o'clock p.m. Uh, here on our Facebook page. It'll be live streamed through Facebook. We'll be doing a little planetarium show. You'll be seeing me again. Um, we will also be uh, celebrating uh, some some science heroes who are leading the fight against uh, against COVID right now. Um, so that's going to be on September 21st at 8 p.m. Um, we'll also be live next Thursday with another planetarium uh, online stream. I want to get that out there before we do totally wrap up our program. Um, well, let's answer a couple more questions here before we do end all, all the time and I totally lose my voice. It's just starting to happen already. I get very excited about black hole. Turns out. Hmm, so Patola asked a really interesting question. I, I actually really like this question. A black hole close enough to swallow the Earth, but not close enough to swallow the sun. Would the sun repel the black hole's gravity? So not really. Um, gravity is an additive force, so you would just have more gravity, right? So the, the, the sun's gravity would add on to the black hole's gravity. Um, unless they were in like opposite directions, then you have the sun pulling you one way and the earth or, and the black hole pulling you the other way. Then you'd be kind of tugged on both sides by a sun and a black hole, and the Earth would probably not like that very much. Um, uh, but if you had, say, the sun here and a black hole here, um, and, and the Earth was like my nose, you'd be pulled in opposite directions, and yeah, the Earth probably wouldn't like that very much. Um, but if you had the sun and a black hole here in my nose is the Earth, then the Earth would just be pulled in this direction, and uh, the Earth wouldn't like that even more. The Earth would like that even less. That'd be a very, very bad experience for the Earth. So, so many good questions. Um, and yeah, I, I do, I do want to give a special shout out to Krista as well, who's been answering so many questions in the chat. Um, Black holes spawn the most questions, I think, of any topic we talk about. 
So I'm very glad that Christopher was able to join us today um, to check that out. Oh, one more, one more thing, one more thing. That I, a question I saw earlier and a question that uh, I get all the time. What happens when black holes collide? What happens when black holes collide? That is such a good question. What happens when black holes collide? Well, let's see what happens. This actually happens fairly often in the universe. We've got two black holes, one over here, one over here. As time goes by, these black holes were, are orbiting each other, and gravity between them is going to pull them closer together, right? As this happens, they're going to begin to move faster and faster and faster and faster and faster as the black holes get closer together. Eventually, these black holes will get so close together, the black holes will collide and explode, leaving behind a bigger black hole. So when two black holes collide, they combine, explode, and leave behind a bigger black hole. Now, inquisitive minds might wonder, what if three black holes collided? Or what if a hundred or a million black holes collided? You'd get a bigger explosion and you'd get a bigger black hole left behind. When black holes collide, they explode. They, they fuse together, lose a little bit of mass and make one black hole that's bigger than either of the two. So, with all of that, I do think uh, it is time for us to wrap things up here today. I want to thank you all so much for joining me today uh, and asking so many incredible questions. I can't thank you enough. It makes these shows so much fun for me to do to answer all your great questions. So thank you so much um, for tuning in. We hope to see you back here next Thursday at 1 o'clock p.m. for another Planetarium Online. Uh, Mike will be here next week talking all about the International Space Station and how to see it in your own sky. It's going to be a really, really great show. Um, we also hope to see you uh, on our Facebook page on September 21st at 8 o'clock p.m. for our I Stand for Science celebration of science and science heroes. Um, there will be a, a planetarium show. I'll be there. You'll be hearing from me. Uh, you'll be hearing from me again. Um, we will be uh, featuring some scientists and public health leaders who are leading the fight we, we are making against COVID um, and featuring some other, some really cool scientists as well. Finally, if you would like to support the Science Center and Planetarium Online, we are open again. Come by, see us. Uh, tickets are available on our website, lsc.org. You can also use the donate button here on our Facebook page if you're able to uh, and would like to support us even more. Um, but with all that, thank you so much once again. Have a wonderful rest of your afternoon. Have a great rest of your week. Um, and uh, take care. Thank you all so much.